everybody, it is the Working Brother, back at you with another talk. Drago Bosnich is back for our not-so-weekly weekly roundup. How are you doing, Drago? It's been a little bit over a week, maybe a bit over two, I don't know, I've been a bit busy. Time, uh, you know, it's relative. Yeah, it's great How have you been? How I, I saw your uh, Telegram channel reached like up to 200 uh, subscribers. I'm, uh, I was yep. feeling proud that I got you to like uh, start the Telegram channel. Um, everybody, link in the description to his Telegram. Link into the, in the description to uh, the Patreon and the Buy Me a Coffee for everybody who's bought me a coffee. Thank you. Uh, everybody else who's new here, welcome. Hi, this is a comedy show. Um, Drago is one of the more uh, well-versed comedians that we bring on here. He writes during the week uh, for uh, the Bricks Information Portal. Um, And then he comes here to tell jokes about it. (laughs) So, um, the first joke of the day... (laughs) Well, maybe not a joke. Um, How uh, BRICS ensures uh, global peace? Yeah, like in in, in this specific uh, article, um, I have to like uh, point out that this is about the BRICS Plus format, which now is going to include a lot more countries than the five five original founders. And the reason why I wrote this is if you look at the map of the new um, countries that are like adjoining BRICS now, you can see that all of them, or a lot of them actually, are former, at this point, former art rivals. Hopefully, they're going to remain former art rivals. Like, for example, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And even in BRICS itself, there are countries which don't have the best possible relationship. Like, for example, Brazil, uh, oh, sorry, uh, India and China. Um, and also, like in BRICS Plus, we'll have uh, Brazil and Argentina, obviously. Uh, being part of the same organization and even though they're not like hostile to each other they are like latin american rivals to a certain degree so what BRICS does in this case is ensures peace because these countries which otherwise would have been at each other's throats are going to like be at least in a cordial relationship and in that in this way BRICS prevents regional conflicts which obviously could turn into like uh, more wider, like wider conflicts um, on a global stage. So th- that's essentially the point of the article. People can see the details in the article itself, but that's essentially the, what, what I tried to, to say in the article itself. Yeah, it's uh, been uh, an eye-opening experience to see all these, like, as you say, micro-rivals, basically, or like enemies on like a local scale, sit together at the same table and uh, and solve their, uh, well, maybe not solve their issues, but at least overlook their differences with like exactly. some uh, bigger goal in mind, yeah. Exactly. If they're going to talk, like, e- they can even fight, like, rhetorically about stuff, but at least they'll be talking, not shooting at each other. And like we see that in the fact that the Saudi Arabia and Iran exchanged ambassadors for the first time in decades. I mean, for the first time since the revolution, as far as I know. So, so this is like a major development. Not that not just in the Middle East, which has been extremely unstable since freedom and all this freedom and democracy came there. So, um, like it's 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 a very good development for everyone there. Um, the next article that you've written recently um, and that we've got lined up as a joke is uh, Wagner's popularity in Africa. How is it? How, how, what is the mystery ingredient and the secret sauce that, 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 that makes Wagner popular in Africa? Tell us, Drago, because I've, like, I've been unable to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so difficult. I mean, 300 years of Western neocolonialism there, or just colonialism if you want, um, I, I guess that's the secret sauce that everybody has been asking about. You know, I, I guess it's very difficult to see it or to pinpoint at it. <laughs> it I mean, in seriousness, Wagner, Wagner only has what, what did they have to do only is just go there and tell, you know, these African governments, OK, we're going to help you to get rid of these bloodsuckers, uh, for the lack of a better term. Um, and you will be able to, you know, like develop freely. You know, nobody's going to be taking away all your, all your resources for pennies or nothing. Um, and and the, the the most interesting point for me is the reaction of the of, of this like of the mainstream media who are now claiming that Wagner is exploiting Africa, which to me was very funny because the logic behind 
Wagner's expansion in Africa is that these African governments are willing to give back Wagner like a mine or even two or five. And then like that's a very cheap way of getting rid of Western uh, imperialism, because like in this way, at least you get the rest of your economy uh, under your own control. And uh, when Westerners come to your country, they send in advisors and these like guys from the World Bank and the IMF. Somebody and somebody he, needs to make a mi make a meme. I give you one mine, and you give me freedom. <laughs> freedom take twenty others, right? I mean, it's, it's so, yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's a win win combination because first of all, Wagner gets a sort of sort of self sustainability, which like relieves the Russian state from having to worry about you know like logistics and stuff like that, and and at the same time, like it helps Russia geopolitically and also with all these African countries. So, so it, to a certain degree, like, I don't think Wagner is going to, you know, lose popularity in Africa anytime soon because, like, people just want to get rid of, you know, like, foreign invaders and enforcers of whatever they want. Um, moving on from Wagner, um, Kiev regime's worst is already rampant rug, drug abuse among its troops. You mean to say that they're not sober? And they're fully conscious when they get, like, limbs blown off and then continue running towards the enemy? Yeah, I know it's shocking. I know it's shocking to most of your uh, viewers because they expect uh, that, the uh, you know, that the Kiev regime forces are very, very sober, as you said. But no, I mean, I, I guess they're using a lot of chocolate and, um, you know, stuff like that. But, but like, you know, all seriousness, now this has become a problem because sometimes when the soldiers return home, they, you know, continue wanting all the chocolate that they've been getting on the front lines. So, like, it's like this spills over into the civilian life. And then who moves in? Well, you know, all sorts of um, legal entrepreneurs. Uh, who, I don't know. I know, don't know about you, but this sounds chocolate. a lot like some of the some of the jihadi fueled uh stuff that was going on in Syria and Iraq and the ISIS Levant thing. Uh, exactly. That exactly. There, was, like, there was like a bunch of uh, planes, I think, that even got like uh, busted with like lots of Keptagon, I think it's called, uh, yep. which is like but, uh, amphetamine, is it not? Something like that. Yeah, it's a combination of amphetamine and several other uh, types of chocolate, as I said, um, which you can, you know, use to become a lot more... Um, uh, keen on the idea of getting your limbs blown off. <laughs> keen on the idea of getting your limbs blown off. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, let's move on from uh, the drugs and uh, go into the lovely nut uh, fanatics. The fanatics of nuts. Um, yeah. Who, uh, what does this word mean? I mean, you know, educate yeah, us. No, that's actually uh, like uh, that, that was an existing unit or like uh, several types of units within the Wehrmacht during World War II when uh, the Germans were so desperate that they started um, conscripting everyone, like uh, women, children, elderly people, people with disabilities, all kinds of physical and mental disabilities. And like, you know, I could have put the title where I, I would say the Kiev regime is taking all these people. Well, I could just say Volkssturm because that's essentially what it is. And, you know, it's, it's incredible how many perils there are between the, you know, the fans of Nazis or the <laughs> neo and their predecessors, ideological predecessors from Germany from the 30s and 40s. So and this is one of them. Like, this is one of those parallels where they are literally, like, emulating uh, their predecessors to, to the letter. Like, they're essentially doing everything that, they, that, 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 that the Germans were doing 80 years ago. And now, like, they're, they're recruiting all these people who should never even be considered for military service. And I've actually posted videos there, and I think you've also posted some of those videos, especially our friend Flores did so. Uh, so, like, there are people with severe mental disabilities who have been drafted or conscripted forcibly, uh, obviously, by the Kiev regime forces. And, like, these are people you wouldn't even, like, give them, like, a knife or even a fork because, like, they could hurt themselves, they could hurt someone else. And they've been given rifles and grenades. So, 
Not to mention, guess, like, not to mention, the, 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 you're talking about mentally handicapped people, but there's also like the the fact that they've constricted all kinds of physically disabled people who are yeah, like not able to no walk arms. or have like uh, no, no, did not like forget the ones who are like, you know, missing limbs. I'm talking about people who like can't walk because they got like muscle atrophy or something like that, and yeah. these people who like are barely functioning and are not, you know. Uh, 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 a member of like you know uh, regular society, they're being expected to to be put into uh, yeah. to, into military service, which is just ridiculous. Um, yeah, like you can't put them in one unit because they're going to kill each other or not be able mm-hmm. to do anything. And if you put them in a unit where there are like people who could be be soldiers, they could hurt those soldiers. So like you're yeah. like. Again, I, I'm pretty sure the the Kiev regime is winning, as the Western media say. <laughs> I, <laughs> um obviously these are all winning winning tactics we know um yeah. i've got like some day, after i posted this article i got information and i'm really sorry that i didn't actually put that in the article because i didn't know about it at the time but just a day later i saw information like which was published that day that women are going to be uh conscripted into the ukrainian army so oh yeah but, yeah it's, Oops. It's ridiculous. what did i do there um uh, oh yeah yeah um I already uh, I saw the video. I I uh, thought about downloading and playing it, but there's no point. There's like a promotional video from the Ukrainian army, if I'm not mistaken. Like, wow, women should serve. It's time for women to step up. And it's just like, hmm. If you're asking for women to step up, what exactly what happened to all the men that already stepped up? Well, they won. Obviously, the Russians lost. <laughs> they went home to celebrate all that. Uh, like, share, and subscribe, everybody. Comment, comment. Good comedy. This is a comedy show. Um, on the not so comedic level, um, this is a video that surfaced today um, of uh, somewhere in western Ukraine, uh, parents of children at a school uh, hunting down and like uh, beating. Hold on, where's the volume? Beating. Uh, Beating a, a professor or like a teacher uh, because he's Russian Orthodox and he speaks uh, Russian. So yeah, the light of the long knife is coming soon. Yeah, kind of thing. Like all the freedom and democracy is obviously making Ukraine, Ukraine a much better place to live in. I guess. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, let me see here. How can we do this? Oh. Do we have a meme? We have a meme. Should we do a meme or like a story that's almost as good as a meme? Let's do a story that's almost as good as a meme. Um, in Germany, in Berlin, somebody put up a graffiti of Zelensky the cannibal and the Berliner Polizei is, uh, is not happy about it and is trying to find out who did that. So there's yeah. your uh, funny news of the day. Let's get back to your articles, which are a little bit more serious. SU-34 goes hypersonic. Quintuples number of Russian Kinjal launch platforms. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, like the uh, Russian military actually, um, uh, just a few days ago, they've uh, announced that they've launched a Kinjal missile from one of, the S- one of their SU-34 fighter bombers. Um, you know, like this platform, like it took some sort, sort of like um, um, some sort of changes in the design of the system of, of the of the jet itself to uh, be able to do that. Because like this jet is not as fast as the MiG thirty one K, which is used as the primary la- launch platform of the Kinjal missiles. But the thing is, like uh, the Russians have around thirty to forty of these. At least they did, like before the SMO. It's it's very likely they've actually increased the number. Uh, of make 31 ks but like the last number i was able to see was 30 to 40. uh so uh like now if they're able to launch kinjals from su-34s that means that they've actually increased the, the number of launch platforms by by times of five at least because there's uh, approximately 150 of these jets in the russian uh, air force and if they can do that, uh, then I guess the you know like the, the number of launch platforms is not just going to go up, but also it's going to be very bad news for the AFU, because uh, what most people don't know is that a lot of times uh, Western uh, ISR platforms, I mean the, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance 
what they do is like they warn Ukrainians about every, every time when a MiG-31, uh, you know, lifts off. Well, that's going to become a lot harder because if you if an Su-34 gets up, I mean, starts flying, uh, then they will not know if the thing is armed with a hypersonic missile or just a regular bomb. Uh, so th that gives Russians a lot, of, a lot more like opportunity to uh, for surprise attacks with Kinjal missiles, and obviously that's not good news for the AFU. So what you're saying is basically, uh, previously, whenever the 31 MiG uh, used to take off, everybody would know that for sure a Kinjal strike is coming, or like highly likely, yeah. let's put it that way. But but now right. what you're saying is that uh, there's like a joker card when, when one of these planes goes up the Su-34, which basically uh, means that, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are going to be more and more nervous. And NATO with them. They will not know when the like a Kinshul strike is coming. Like they will not be, they, they, they will not have like an advance notice of an hour or so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, speaking of airplanes and Su 34s, considering you're like a military analyst and whatnot, um, among other things, uh, where is my little? There we go. Plane tires. Uh, what is this? Why? 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 Like, are the Russians serious? Like what? Yeah, why did like, uh, I think uh, some of the like more serious Russian military analysts and and even like people who are like in the Russian military, like for example the fighter bomber, uh, mm -hmm. you can see on his channel like uh, a very good explanation as to why this is actually a viable strategy. I mean, I've seen various sorts of um, let's say ridiculous explanations, as, like like claiming that tires actually break the guidance systems of some drones, which to me is like ludicrous. The point is, like, this is physical <laughs> protection. Like, like, just like you have tires, you know, in these rallies and, you know, like car rallies, uh, mm -hmm. which are supposed to, like, protect and, and prevent, like, a, like the destruction or, or severe damage to cars, they can do the same uh, for airplanes, w which are parked on, um, on, the, uh, on the runways. And, uh, like, it's, it's about physical protection because tires are, like, a very good, very cheap solution uh, and uh, that's all all it is to, to it like there's no mystery or anything um i came across this cartoon earlier on telegram of <laughs> like it could be ukrainian propaganda i don't know but it's still funny like of a plane flying with like a cop cage and <laughs> and, and all yeah, these tires on it like <laughs> like the whole the whole point is like uh, you know the the only two of the uh, two uh, tu uh, 95 ms uh, strategic bombers that actually had tires on them are the two which are not active in one of the bases uh, of the russian air force so like it like it's not even a, a very widespread you know thing in the russian air force it's just like a way to protect mm -hmm. them from like these uh, fpv drones or like even long range drones which don't really carry a lot of explosives but they could damage the jet or an airplane um, or any other aircraft uh, and and you know prevent it like it's not going to destroy the the, the the aircraft but it's going to prevent it from you know fulfilling fulfilling its mission uh, you yeah. know, for this week or whatever um I just wanted to highlight that the basically the very next day after the tire photo surfaced, this photo and a couple of others, which I didn't find or download, um, also surfaced, which is like a really much more realistic option of guarding jets with, yep. you know, actual or nets. They could just put them into hangars, I guess. <laughs> you fucking radical you you want to be like yeah. north korea huh just like put everything in the mountains and get it over with um yeah. <laughs> speaking of north korea we should maybe get to that at some point but we'll uh, we'll cover it when we get to vietnam let's see uh, what this other article we have here oh musky musk um how musky <laughs> Did he really prevent a mini Pearl Harbor? <laughs> mini Pearl Harbor, really? Yeah, like he's been claiming a lot of sketchy stuff uh, since the SMO started, and and to be honest, I'm not very convinced. Like I would be con like closer to believing him if it weren't for the all the very lucrative uh, Pentagon contracts that his companies are you know having uh, or have been having like for for I don't know for a decade now at this point. Um, like he claims that he turned off um, the Starlink system, 
um, in the middle of a, like a NATO coordinated attack on the Russian fleet. And he would, he, he claims that he would walk away from this, you know, without getting arrested for, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Like if any civilian were to inv get involved or prevent or whatever, um, a NATO military like, uh, operation, uh, I don't think he would be walking free, you know, like he wouldn't get the chance to, to, you know, live to tell about it. So, uh, I don't really believe this, to be honest. Um, and and the idea that he's like this sort of anti-establishment, you know, hero is ridiculous when actually right now his company, one of his companies, SpaceX, is developing a militarized version of Starlink, which is called Starshield. And like the NATO, NATO actually used all the experience they had from the SMO, from the usage of Starlink against the Russian military to actually improve Starshield. So, so like... And also, like the idea that he's when he said like last year that he will continue financing uh, Starlink for the Ukrainian army free of charge, that was also not true because it turned out that the Pentagon has been paying him, you know, very good money to continue doing that. So that's like those are two very important lies that he said um, in, in the last year or so. And you know, I don't think th that that spells very good, you know. To, to believe what he's saying in the future, so. I never liked Musk. He was always suspy. Um, and plus, with this whole X, the app of everything type of attitude that he's uh, trying to, like, uh, promote with his new rebranding, I am uh, not, not, not a big fan. You could say that. Uh, Pretty much. Um, yeah. But I'm a conspiracy theorist skeptic. On the other scope of the spectrum of people, there's these people. Um, Kolomoisky arrested. Justice or just another power grab by Zelensky? Can you tell us who Kolomoisky is? Haha, <laughs> because this video is probably going to yes, get banned anyway. The, uh, <laughs> well, like the Westerners would say um, entrepreneur, but since he's not a Westerner, now he's just an oligarch, right? That's the new speak that you have to um, you know, honor to be uh, eligible for freedom and democracy, I guess. But like in all seriousness, he, he is one of the Ukrainian oligarchs who actually financed not just the Kiev regime, but specifically the Azov Battalion, you know, the, all those um, very loving and caring guys who have been um, not doing anything, you know, illegal or illicit or brutal or genocidal. Like they have nothing to do with that, obviously. Um, and like he was arrested um, for supposed embezzlement of... Uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of state funds. Um, well, I guess, you know, the Kiev regime is probably like two decades late. Uh, but anyway, they did it. And obviously, like, it's it's poetic justice, but like justice was not their primary concern, obviously. They just wanted to get rid of a guy who is not very keen on, you know, becoming cannon fodder in America's war against Russia. So, um, like, he's an opportunist. So that's why he even like the two years ago or three mm -hmm. years ago, he tried, you know, uh, getting on the Russia's good side, which the Russians obviously like ignored because they know what who Holmoisky is. And uh, at the end of the article, I actually concluded that the guy is essentially like your Ukrainian Soros because he had no qualms about financing a neo-Nazi um, organization, despite himself being a Jew. And uh, Soros is also a Jew, but he had no qualms about working with you know, the World War II era Nazis uh, to sell, you know, their, his own people also who were also Jews. And he, actually, he said this in one of his interviews that he said, he said, literally, he said, like, well, there was no one else to do it. So, you know, somebody had to do it. So I, I just, you know, jumped in and did it. And like, he, so he, he like said, literally, he literally quoted the other guy, huh? Like he, like, yeah. uh, no, no comment. Um, uh, I think George Webb is the name of a good reporter that uh, has uh, gone really deep into the Kolomoisky connections with Ukraine, and you can uh, yeah. look that up. And if you get to him, uh, do leave a comment. Tell him the working brother sent you, and tell him that I'm still waiting for an answer. Uh, I invited him on long, long ago, but he uh, was busy. In any case... Let's move uh, right along to Russia being unprovoked and all kinds of uh, Russian propaganda brought to us by Stoltenberg, nonetheless. Stoltenberg, yeah. of everyone, head NATO chief, underwear model, well, I believe he was, a yeah, long time ago. That's the mainstream is he the media one that, is, 
Is he the one that was an underwear model in his like uh, university career? Yeah, probably. I can't remember if, if it was him or the previous guy. Uh, I forgot. I his think name. it was him. I think it was yeah, this guy. Probably him. In any case, um, what's he saying here? That Russia was unprovoked? Yeah, like, I, I guess he's quoting the RT and Sputnik and all these other Russian propaganda outlets. Uh, but in all seriousness, like, he was actually bragging about the fact that, you know, Putin got more NATO instead of getting less NATO. So, it, you know, in doing so, he inadvertently said that everything that Putin complained about, you know, in years before, the uh, the smo that was actually true that like it wasn't really russian propaganda it was just like basic strategic thinking on the part of the russians who didn't want a belligerent alliance to you know come near their borders and now he's bragging that you know nato is actually getting closer to these borders so essentially he admitted and this was like during a speech at the Euro uh, european parliament or the eu parliament actually um and, and he was talking about this, and I, I didn't see anyone in Western media, you know, saying this, like saying, hey, the guy just admitted that the Russians were right all along and the, the SMO could have been prevented by NATO not expanding to Russian borders. And obviously they did the opposite. Um, it's almost like they planned it. I yeah. uh, want to I wanna take a little break from your articles. Um, I hope you don't mind uh because you have no option uh, <laughs> um and we're gonna play a video that i earl gray shared about some uh recycling of the dead in ukraine to be fertilizer let's see what this is about oh it's all in ukrainian but the point is um you can use your ashes to fertilize the future of Ukraine with your dead ones. That's amazing. Um, that's so progressive and like futuristic. Wow. Yeah. This is the video that you were talking about. Hold on, let me play it full screen. Мамі не вистачило грошей, щоб дати хабара. А батькові не допомогли старі зв'язки. Ти намагався сховатися, але їм треба м'ясо. Бо леопарди їм жаль. І своїх дітей їм жаль. А тебе – ні. Тепер у тебе лише один – Останній шанс зберегти життя. Powerful. Yeah. Russian propaganda. Yeah. Almost like I Stoltenberg think... made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in all seriousness, I do think, well, when it comes to these like two videos that you just played, um, I, I really hope more and more Ukrainians see this because they have very they have two alternatives like they have two possibilities like you can be a biodegradable capsule that's gonna um i guess uh, fertilize all this black black rock land uh now or you can just you know give up and start <laughs> stop fighting for the damn black rock and you know just give up and uh, surrender to the russians and make sure that your country isn't turned into <laughs> neo degeneracy you know, for the next 50 years or so. At first, uh, at first I thought you misspoke. I thought you meant like black soil, but then I realized you literally mean black rock, the company that yeah. now owns most of Ukraine. Yeah. So you're like fighting not for the black soil of Ukraine, but for black rock, literally. For black rock, <laughs> which is going to take like 30% or 40% of Ukrainian arable land. And like, do you really want that? Like, don't you want to go back to your family and kids if you have kids uh, and, you know, like just live a normal life instead of, you know, be, be getting killed for nothing um sticking on the comedy theme um this also surfaced uh what can you find can you see the similarities between their behavior um i wonder what it is do you think it has anything to do with that other uh, article that you about mentioned? the shock very yeah. likely and this is an extraordinary nato summit in the middle of moscow this this video made me laugh the other day 
<laughs> um, anyway, let's get uh, back to actual news. Let me switch here to your articles. We've already done Stoltenberg. And now, oh, open secrets. The best kind of secrets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us about this Taiwan, is, Drago. Yeah, like this one is uh, about uh, exercise, military exercises that were conducted in Michigan between the, the U.S. military and the Taiwanese military. And uh, there were up to 7,000 7, soldiers in this exercise, which is pretty, like, like pretty like mass not really massive but massive enough to uh like simulate actual warfare so uh, like why is the u.s doing this i i guess like the the ttlu or to the last ukrainian will soon become ttlt or to the last Ta taiwanese or actually ttls the last semiconductor if we consider uh, all the things that uh, u.s congressmen have been saying about uh, you know the need to protect semiconductors from the evil chinese so, um, you know, I didn't know there I, was an acronym for it. TTL, what to the last you what, again? What, what was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like what, what I said is TTLU, which is to the last Ukrainian, is going to turn into TTLT or to the last Taiwanese soon. If uh, if the Taiwanese people don't, I mean, the Chinese people who live in Taiwan, which, which because that's what they are essentially. Ooh, uh, shots fired! <laughs> <laughs> All the Taiwanese people who don't feel Chinese, let yourself be known in the comments. Sure, uh, <laughs> all three of you. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, but in all seriousness, like I really hope the, the people who live in Taiwan, whatever they, they consider themselves to be, will not be as naive as, you, as so many Ukrainians have been and think that America is going to bring them anything good. Uh, they probably should start to consider themselves from Chinese Taipei. Uh -huh. yeah. um, about weird stuff that's going on yeah, recently. Why, this is pretty weird. This this like tops the like high level tier weird news. Um, what is Armenia doing? What is going on here? Yeah, I've been asking myself the same question for over three years now, and to be honest, I really don't know. Like I I, I I've been trying to get you know to the bottom of it for years, and uh, I I don't understand why anyone in Armenia, like anyone with with two functioning brain cells, would support this guy, this Bashinian guy. Because what he has brought to Armenia has been an absolute disaster, geopolitical, economic, you name it. So, uh, like most people, like I see a lot of Armenians who are now hating on Russia and thinking the Russians have left them, but they've been ignoring decades prior to our Pashinians, uh, you know, coming to power. So they don't even know, a lot of people don't know that between 1994, when the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict stopped, I mean, the first Nagorno-Karabakh to 2018, when Pashinyan took power, the Russians have been stopping potential Azeri invasions for all these years, like for, for so like almost 25 years. So what happened in 2018, Pashinyan came to power, and one of the first things he did was to ban Russian language schools, to uh, start banning Russian language media, you know, like to distance himself from Russia for no reason whatsoever. And then he also, you know, like announced that Armenia is going to get into the, the so-called Euro-Atlantic integration, which means like getting into the EU and NATO. And I don't think, like, I, I don't understand how he actually believed that the Russians would continue providing all this, uh, you know, unconditional support while he was like, you know, making all these anti-Russian moves. So the Russians had a, like a choice now. They could get into a confrontation with Turkey and Azerbaijan, which were like relatively on a relatively good terms with Russia for the sake of Armenia, which was distancing itself from Russia. So, you know, like, how do you like make peace with those two things? How do you like, how do you conduct geopolitics while a person that is supposed to be our ally is doing everything again? And the worst part is uh, actually Pashinyan, uh, he expanded the U.S. embassy in Yerevan which now houses like approximately 2,000 people, many of whom are intelligent op intelligence operatives who are not friendly to Russia, obviously. And at the same time, 2,000 Russian soldiers are, you know, protecting Artsakh or the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you know, from the, from the Azerbaijani military. So, like, 
how how is, maybe you know, he how, maybe he just wanted to get them all in one place so the kinjal like they don't have to hit more than once once yeah, they do maybe start he's hitting like it. a russian no, like no maybe he likes russia i mean but but in all seriousness like now he's like distancing himself from russia and, and he actually obviously said it directly in a in a recent interview with la repubblica which is an italian newspaper and he said like relying on russia was a mistake at the time when the Russian military is the only thing standing between the rest of the people of the Gorno Karabakh and the Azerian military. So, and, and not just that, like he doesn't realize that like Armenia can't even get into NATO because Turkey is a member of NATO and all Turkey has to do is like veto any sort of ascension of uh, accession of, of Armenia to NATO and th that's going to be enough to prevent uh, NATO from, from getting Armenia, snatching Armenia. And the Turks are obviously going to do that. So, Turks, like, are, you... Turks are a different story, man. I don't know what the Turks are doing, man. With the whole Sweden and Finland thing, that's what I was counting on with the Turks. But like the Turks seem to have like oh, backed down, and the, the Turks... Turks are building a ship for the the Turks are building a ship for the Ukrainians. <laughs> like, and yeah. at the same time, the Turks are like, I don't know. But the the like the best part was was when when Erdogan went to see Putin. Uh, the walk that Erdogan had after that meeting said enough about what was going on in that meeting. Um, yeah, like, like, the Turks are not allies to Russia, but but the thing is, like, they're not also like direct enemies, as in terms of like they still like uh, allow certain things for Russia to know. For example, the the fact that uh, the Russians have economic cooperation with Turkey, which is beneficial to both sides. So, like, the Turks are com com uh, compartmentalizing their uh, uh, foreign policy. And I'm, I'm not saying I never said it's pro-Russian. It's never been pro-Russian. And they've been enemies for centuries. So, obviously, you know, uh, it's very likely there will be enemies in the future, too. But uh, right right now, like, Turkey's real politic is very, very beneficial to Russia uh, in certain areas of the geopolitical uh, situation in the region. Uh, but, but the point is, if the Russians get on Armenia's side 100 percent, they need something, you know, in return, as in, for example, not doing any anti-Russian moves on Armenia's side, on Armenia's part. So and that's exactly what the Armenians have been doing. I mean, not the Armenian people, but but this Pashinyan government, who, which is making like all these idiotic anti-Russian moves while they don't have a viable ally to replace Russia, because the Russians are not protecting only uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, but they're protecting Armenia itself. And and the Turks and the Azeris, they want um, Armenia wiped off the map because it's the only thing standing between them. So, like, it, it's it's a very, like, it's a very stupid thing, you know, to get on Russia's bad side when Russia is the only country protecting, you know, your very existence. What can I say? A lot of people are doing a lot of stupid things these days in uh, geopolitics. Uh, <laughs> crazy, little, crazy. I don't get it. I don't. Um, I think uh, some people are trying to start World War Three. I don't know about you, but that's been the running theory yeah. here. Uh, I got a question. Do you? We've, we're like 38 minutes in exactly now. Um, do you want to? We've got four more articles, a couple of videos, and some memes. Do you want to run through everything now, or do you want to pause this and uh, come back in a minute and uh, run through them as another episode? What do you think? Sure, we can do that. I guess. All right. Um, everyone, thank you for sticking around. Like, share, subscribe. If you're new here, all that good stuff the music we'll be right back for you it'll be tomorrow though see you later